let's, uh, let's quickly segue on to the M18. Uh, the, the whopping speed of the M18, I mean, just how much of an advantage does this give the vehicle in combat? Um, well, when you, when you look at the uh, after-action reports, I, I have not found a single case where a unit reported that the ability of the, the Hellcat to move at 55 miles an hour made the slightest difference in a battle. Now, th it did make a difference in the sense that uh, the M18 was fast enough to keep up with mechanized cavalry. And Third Army in particular was very good about lashing up uh, the M18 with the cavalry groups. And uh, that, that gave the ver otherwise very lightly armed cavalry some real firepower uh, if they ran into trouble. Uh, but it, it was kind of interesting that people who, who fought in the M18 really thought highly of it. But there was one case where the Army wanted to convert a unit from uh, M10s to M18s because the M10 was out of production and there weren't enough new ones, and the unit rebelled over it. They didn't want to be put in this thing that had armor about yay thick uh, that could stop small arms fire and not much else. And they, they actually succeeded in getting the M36 instead. Uh, okay. Uh, Nick, we shouldn't overlook the ammunition burden posed by introducing new type model series of guns or even specialized improved uh, projectiles because, the, Steve, you've, we've talked about how the 76 millimeter gun is available before Normandy. They're actually, the tanks are actually in England, but no one wants to introduce the logistics burden of another round of ammunition, not to speak of the training burden of a, of a new, uh, new type cannon. So this, the burden of supplying a, an additional type of ammunition to what you're already struggling with in army size operations has to be considered when you think about the decisions of how fast you want to introduce a new, new type cannon. Yeah, and there's an interesting detail there, too, and you war gamers will appreciate that, and that's that when we talk about 76 millimeter and 3 inch with the U.S. Army, just to show the complication, that's two different ammunition feeds. The projectiles are the same. The U.S. 76 millimeter gun that's in the M18, that's in the, uh, the Shermans, the various 76 millimeter guns in the Shermans, that uses one family of ammunition. The 3 inch gun that's used on the M10 has virtually the same projectile, different propellant casing, Therefore, when you're supplying the ammunition into the field, even though it's really just one caliber, they call it 3-inch and 76 millimeter to distinguish the two, but you have two different feeds of ammunition because of that. And that, that just complicates things even further. Okay, we're, we're going to change gears here. I, I just got a rather uh, innovative question from Jason uh, about uh, unusual methods of transporting they tanks. Where are you? They came up with all sorts of stuff. In fact, they came up with an a, a, a airdrop vehicle without a parachute. Um, there was a, the, 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 Ru the Russians were very, very big into airborne forces. They came up with a way of delivering troops in a pod with wheels on it. You carry it underneath the TB3 bomber, you'd fly it over the ground, and you'd drop it, and you'd go bloop, 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 bloop. So you, needless to say, and there was also going to be a water version. It was going to drop in the water and bloop, 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 and, and float. <laughs> well, needless to say, this is a really, really stupid idea. And they built one, dropped it in the water, because they thought the water would be soft. And they dropped it into the water and just disintegrated. So they dropped that idea. <laughs> so then they said, well, you know, we, we, and the, the reason was that the Russians didn't have a lot of silk. The Russians were very practical. Silk is very expensive. And in some countries like Russia, it's hideously expensive. So they wanted to get away from, from that sort of thing. Now, obviously, a parachute that would carry a tank would be hideously large and hideously expensive. So I wanted to come up with a different idea. So Antonov, who now is well known, he later became the Russian designer of all the famous great Russian um, uh, transport aircraft, the you know, Antonov 12, Antonov 2, all those aircraft. He designed a glider design, a biplane glider, to carry the little T-60 light tank. And the idea is you'd attach this biplane frame around the T-60, and you'd fly the thing in, and then you'd take the wings off and drive off into battle. They built these, and they tested them. And the problem, as anybody in the armor business will know, is that the, the, the friction involved in the tracks going around the wheels, there's a limit to how fast you can do that. And stop to think what aircraft speeds are. Aircraft speeds are not tank speeds. Um, stall speeds for aircraft are in the 80 mile an hour, 90 mile an hour range. And so when you try to take it off, you've got a problem because the, the bomber aircraft that's towing it, the glider tug, 
can't get fast enough because it's got this big heavy weight. And it's not really the weight, it's the friction of the tracks. Um, so they had problems getting it up in the air. And then, of course, when it lands, there's a problem because the tracks can't, can't move around fast enough when it comes down at 70 or 80 miles an hour. So that idea is dropped. But the, um, the Russians are not the only ones to try that. The Japanese actually have a program, although it never actually reaches the stage where they actually build it. The real solution, and David can talk about this, is rather than rely on the tracks, if you stick the whole vehicle in a glider, and it's not only the British, the Germans do it also, you stick, the, you stick a light tank in, inside the fuselage of a glider. And that becomes practical, and there's many examples of that during World War II. So the, pro the problem with the flying tanks is, flying tanks are great if they're inside, but if they're on the outside with the tracks out there, well, I mean, that, 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 that was great for, to get it there, but how, how did Tetrarch, Harry Hopkins, and Locus actually do? Um, useless, absolutely useless. <laughs> what, what is the point of landing on a battlefield swarming with pi panthers, tigers, and Lord alone knows what else? in a seven-ton tank with a 40-millimeter gun. I've talked to the guys that did it, and I, I tell you what, I wouldn't go up in an aeroplane if I didn't have to come here with an engine fitted to it, never mind one that had to be towed up into the sky with a seven-ton tank inside. Um, no, absolutely pointless. The only effect was to put the tanks onto the battlefield in a place where they were not expected which frightened the life out of the Germans and caused them to start looking over their shoulders. If they knew what was there, they wouldn't have worried. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just go back quickly to the Christie thing, we have a catalogue in the museum library, and in it there is a picture of a very smart-looking aircraft, but it is only an artist's impression, with a tank hanging underneath. And what Christie planned to do was by having these very high-speed tanks, as Steve says, he was going to have the aircraft sweep onto the battlefield, the driver would start it up, the tank tracks would belt and round, the plane would drop the tank and go away. Um, well, he never got round to building it. He did actually build um, a small combat car-type vehicle. He put his son in it, <laughs> and, and he dropped it from a crane, and the, the boy had impacted... Um, spinal column ever afterwards. Um, so it, it was just physically impossible. No human being would stand it. The Germans had their nutty professor too, and you all probably know who that is, Dr. <laughs> Porsche. And he influenced uh, Uncle Adolf uh, because he was very close to him, and he kept coming up with these wonderful ideas and driving the army and the procurement guys absolutely crazy because they did not want all these rubbish designs for a rear transmission and so they had a perfectly good system in Panthers and they didn't want anything new. Uh, that's it. The question I'm just having me looking at was about the transmissions actually. Uh, the, there's a question of was there historical evidence suggesting tra tank transmission oil could be a source of fire after a hit, specifically German tanks with a front mounted transmission? <laughs> well, <laughs> not, not really. I mean, uh, lubricants burn, period. Uh, uh, if you just, uh, it doesn't, it's not a major problem, and they never thought it worthwhile to change that. Right at the end of the war, the Panzer Commission, but remember I said earlier on, these are the industry guys with Dr. Porsche and so forth. They're coming up with these wonderful ideas to put the engines at the back and the transmissions at the back. and in a package and so forth, um, but uh, this was years away from being perfected. T t tanks are all full of stuff that burns. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the problem with trying to pick out anything, I mean, we could get into the controversy about gas versus diesel powered and all that sort of thing. The real problem in tank fire is the ammunition propellant. When you come right down to it, if, if the tank is penetrated and the ammunition propellant goes off, get the hell out of the tank. <laughs> there, there's no way you can stop the fire. By, well, by far, every time that there was any operational research done on tank casualties, the critical burning element is not the gasoline or diesel fuel or transmission fluid, it's the ammunition propellant. If that st stuff starts up, forget it. Well, 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 why not get into the diesel petrol argument then? I mean, if the Russians went diesel, the Marines went diesel, everybody else went petrol. Why? Well, totally different reasons, because uh, there's not an additional fire hazard, because tanks can burn from all kinds of reasons, and when you find burned out tanks on a battlefield, you have no idea what started it, but it ends up looking uh, a big mess. 
the American, the American Marine Corps took the diesel tank uh, because uh, at the International Tank Conference of, uh, of uh, late 41, it found that uh, only the Russians were taking the diesel tanks. The American Army decided it didn't want diesel overseas. The M10 was an, an exception, again, because of a, a different supply chain requirement that they wanted to avoid. Uh, but the uh, British and the American armies were fighting over the, M the M4, A1, A3, and, and uh, A4s as much for as many as they could get. The Marine Corps saw that it could get the M4, A2 diesel uh, uh, version at least six months sooner uh, than fighting with the British and the Army for the same vehicles. And that's why they took it. It was not for landing craft fuel uh, matching or anything like that. It was simply available. Uh, they liked it a lot. They fought when they had to go to gasoline tanks uh, uh, in 1944. The first tank battalion kept theirs through the end of the war. But it's very difficult to prove that, uh, that uh, actually, the problem is to prevent your tank from being penetrated by an anti-tank weapon, and that's how you, you handle fire problems in tanks. Just reminds me about, oh, a few years ago now, I took a United States state governor, I won't name the state, uh, around the museum, and he had his deputy governor with him, and we were looking at the Tiger, and the deputy governor said, Governor, do you know all the German tanks have diesel engines? I thought, now, do I say anything? Do I get him <laughs> made to look a complete idiot or not? Um, and there is a paper, I was mentioning it to Hillary earlier on, in which they state, German engineers state, that the reason they went for a gasoline-powered tank in almost every tank they built was that they wanted maximum performance for five hours. If, they'd had, if the requirement handed down to them had been maximum performance for ten hours per battlefield day, they would have gone for diesel. So that is a, was apparently their basic reason for going for gasoline in the first place. I, I, I have no qualifications. My only sort of written qualification in life is a Melbourne tram driver's license, which is completely useless at a tank museum. So uh, I'm one of those ancient people who could start it out before qualifications matter. Otherwise, I'd be on the streets begging now. It didn't seem to go like that. I just kept going there and going there until they got used to me. And then finally, when the job came up, they gave it to me. So, yeah, I didn't even have to ask for the job. I got given it. That's dropping. We're doing much more educational work for children and very little for the army now. Um, it's all part, because their programs, the schedules are cut so fine, the least important thing appears to be historic education. So our part has diminished considerably. Um, that's difficult, and I'll tell you why. We are very good on First World War. No one can, can touch us. We've got the best collection of First World War tanks any place. And also, I would say, between the wars, which is a very formative period for British armour. But at the same time, because um, the public perception of the museum is changing, because the whole nature of museums is changing to make them more um, visitor friendly, to get the families, the children, the wives in, we are having to change how we display things. And that's going to mean, I think, fewer vehicles actually on display and more in the reserve collection. And I think that's the way it'll go everywhere. Um, not really. We have a Rolls-Royce armoured car, which I'm very, very fond of. It's not the only one in the world. Uh, right, we'll move on then, sticking with the Panther. Uh, great reputation. By all the facts and figures, it should have been an absolutely dominating weapon, but in practice, it didn't necessarily have the best combat performance. Why? I think uh, the answer is there's nothing that one can question about the Panther at the particular time. It was as good as you could get. But you have to remember the German army was effectively defeated by 1944 when they were fielding the Panthers. So the vast majority of the crews 
were young kids that had never driven a vehicle. You, it's hard to imagine a world where you don't learn to drive as quick as you can, but these guys didn't. They were given at most an hour or two driving a vehicle around, and the crew, the overall crew, there was very few guys left in those tanks that had been around for any length of time. So that's the big issue that's coming down the track. And uh, then you get this other question I mentioned earlier on. A lot of good equipment has been issued to these political units. And I think we know how the Republican Guard performed in the sand pit. <laughs> If, if I can go at it from a different angle um, to kind of accent what, what Hillary has said, um, the Panther tank was, pro at least in the Western Front, was probably defeated as much by the U.S. Army Air Force and not the usual way you think about, you know, all the claims of P-47 strafing and all that sort of thing. In May of 1944, U.S. Army Air Force started bombing the German synthetic oil fields or the, the synthetic oil plants. Um, at the, roughly the same time, in uh, June of 1944, Germany starts to lose the Romanian oil fields, first by RAF mining of the Danube, and then later the Red Army, of course, takes the, the oil fields. So there's suddenly an enormous shortage of fuel. Um, now, what the immediate impact in the, the personnel issue is that you are starting with young kids who don't know how to drive, and suddenly you have no fuel to teach them how to drive. This might seem a trivial issue to Americans, where we're used to going down to the pump. But in World War II, fuel supply is a very, very big issue, especially in Germany. And if you go and read any of the accounts, there's some very good accounts of uh, Panther units towards the end of the war. If you're interested in the Ardennes campaign, there's the two volumes, Duel in the Mist, and the, uh, which deals with uh, First SS Panzer Division. There's an excellent chapter in that towards the end talking about training the Panther crews in the months preceding the Ardennes campaign. Nice. And you can see how they, they have no training. They, they, they go into the Ardennes campaign. There's small numbers of crews that have survived since Normandy, but very, very small numbers. And all these young kids who are coming in, they have months and months to train, but they simply can't train. They don't have the ammunition and they don't have the fuel. And uh, after you read that, you can appreciate the difficulties. Well, what, what was the overall effectiveness of the strategic bombing campaign then against tank production? I mean, we the, the, more the, and more airplanes. It didn't, it didn't yeah. have any uh, impact on the production, not really. They lost a few vehicles in various bombing raids on the production line. But the main problem was the logistics, uh, getting the stuff to the front, and the fuel supplies. Those were the issues. It, it, it's not widely appreciated. The, 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 uh, the Allies didn't bomb the German tank plants. There was no program to bomb the German tank plants. At various points in time, the, uh, the various combined bomber offensives had targets, but the tank plants were, were seldom on that list. There was a very, very short life program in the fall of 1944 that lasted about a month to attack the tank plants. One of the only impacts it had was on the King Tiger production. Um, it, it, it did dramatically affect that, but uh, Panther production, the other production, it really wasn't um, as effective as people might suspect it was. But the, the, the tank plants simply weren't a significant target on, on the list. The fuel plants were, there were many other objectives, the ball bearing plants at various times, fuel plants. The Luftwaffe was the, the industry that was attacked most, uh, most, uh, uh, most intensely during 1944. The U.S. Army Air Force had a very deliberate program in the early part of 1944 to smash the fighter production. And, it, it, and it didn't succeed on my yeah, there, was, there was one tank uh, that was completely put out of production by the uh, bombing campaign, and that was because uh, the uh, bombing campaign hit uh, Krupp in Essen, and that knocked out the mouse production. It wouldn't have had any impact anyway, <laughs> but the mouse didn't come into being because it was bombed. And they, could, they only had one plant manufacturing the, uh, the armored hulls, and that was the end of that, <laughs> fortunately. But also when you, when you think about Panther performance, I mean, the Americans first faced some at Anzio, but not many. And <coughs> then if you, if you look at uh, the, the clashes between American armor uh, and, and Panthers starting with D-Day, uh, doing tank-on-tank -tank comparison really makes no sense because on the battlefield, the number of clashes, large-scale clashes between uh, German tanks and American tanks is remarkably small. 
And instead, you have a tactical situation where the Germans are doing essentially what the Americans are doing with their uh, attached tank battalions to the infantry division. They're fighting in small packets. In Normandy, they're fighting on terrain where, uh, where often they're exchanging fire at 25 or 50 yards. And the advantages of the Panther, the, the long, powerful gun, just don't come into play. Uh, also, the, the uh, British and American Air Forces are damaging the Panther indirectly by, by destroying the supply lines into Normandy. And you see reports of German uh, divisions having to simply abandon perfectly good Panthers in the field because they can't fuel the things. Uh, the Falaise pocket costs a lot of armor, and once you get all the way to the Siegfried line, again, you're back in, in a tactical situation where uh, the, the Panthers' advantages don't make all that much difference. Secondly, you have to look at, uh, you have to look at the whole package. The, the United States Army has huge advantages over uh, the, the Panzertruppe. Uh, it can focus fire, artillery fire, quickly on a single armored vehicle. Uh, it can call in airstrikes. Uh, it, can, uh, it can bring enough tank destroyers together in one spot that you're going to get three angles of attack on a single vehicle. Uh, and if you look at the Battle of the Bulge, um, it's remarkable how effective uh, even stock 75 millimeter Shermans were against the Panthers, in part because of the crew training issues, but also tankers on the defensive have a lot of advantages uh, because of the tactical situation. <laughs>